Welcome and welcome back to Me and Epiphany, where we talk about science, philosophy, history, religion, and everything in between. Today, I want to talk to you about fraternities and sororities. And I'm going to start here because I think it will help you get the best understanding. Now, before you come in the comments, And try to tell me about what your sorority is and what it ain't. I'm not speaking as a person who's strictly a researcher right now. I actually was in a sorority. I actually went to college and saw these ladies. Saw what I thought they were about and... I decided to join. Now there's a whole process and those who have done it know exactly what I'm talking about. And those who have tried to do it know what I'm talking about. And even if you just heard it through the grapevine, you know, first it begins with a whisper. This is where people are beginning to talk about there being a line. And then there's an intake process. Typically, For most people, you went to a meeting. I know that I went to an intake meeting where they introduced themselves and let us know about the organization that we were deciding to join. And from then, we were presented with a list of qualifications. And it pretty much from that point went, you were on a scavenger hunt to get all these boxes checked off. They wanted references. They wanted to make sure that you had the the proper grade so you had to get transcripts they wanted to make sure that you had the community service so you had to get letters and people sign off on the fact that you were doing these things and you were about who you said you were about and then the submission and the waiting period I remember when the letters did start finally trickling in, trickling in, you saw people coming from the mailboxes, happy, joyous. And then you saw some people coming away from those mailboxes in tears because it was that serious of a thing to be chosen to be in a sorority. You were looked at in high regard. I remember, and just to be transparent, you know, just the being being in the parties, you know, any other day, we hands on the knees. Oh man, but when we were on, when that line came out, when we knew we were being watched as candidates, we were like wallflowers. We barely even moved. So then when we finally were chosen, that's when they took us through this process of learning knowledge. We had to learn all about their organization, all about the founders, all about their traditions. We had to know their rules and their bylaws. They took us through this whole ordeal. And then the rituals came we were made to dress as one and we were made to light candles and in a dark room and there was a book open on this altar looking thing and we were walking in a circle and we were chanting and we were singing songs and this is what we would do we would sing songs to the organization. And we would sing our hearts out about how we were going to give our heart and our soul to this organization. And we pledged that we were going to give lifelong service to this organization. That's what I did. Did you do that? 
Did you say that you were going to not tell people about the things that went on in the organization? Did you go through any type of ritual? You know, so people, y'all know what I'm talking about. So let's dive into this. Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, also known as the Boule, was founded May 15, 1904 in Philadelphia. It is the oldest existing Greek letter postgraduate fraternity, originally founded by and for prominent Black professional men. Its founders were Henry McKee Minton, a pharmacist, Algernon B. Jackson, doctor, Edwin Clarence Joseph Turpin Howard, doctor, Richard John Warwick, dentist, Eugene Theodore Henson, doctor, and Robert Jones Abele, doctor. The fraternity began as a secret society and modeled itself after the Council of Chiefs or Council of Arapagus, the name given to the government institution that met on the hill of Arapagus, which presided over the city of Athens, Greece. In ancient Greece, these were noblemen advising the king. After candidates served as one of the nine archons, a term meaning chief magistrate or another word for ruler, they became Arapagus for life. These were the aristocrats of society a Greek word that means rule of the best. By definition, power is placed in the hands of a small, privileged ruling class. In Gnostic religious traditions, archons were seven supernatural beings associated with the seven classical planets and considered to be the creators of the physical world. In a book titled Hypostasis of the Archons, their physical appearance is that of a hermaphrodite with the face of beast. Another name for the aristocrats is Boule, which existed in the constitutional city-states of Corinth, Argos, Athens, Chios, and Cyrene in the 6th century BC. The Boule had replaced the aristocratic Gerosia, known as the Council of Elders. These were nine candidates who had reached 60 years of age and held the position of elder for life. The council comprised of 30 elders and two kings. The Boule grew from 400 to 500 and was later called the Council of 500. Their functions were defined by oaths for the members. Their most important tasks were drafting deliberations for approval of city-states and its citizens known as the Ecclesia. According to the Boule system of belief and principles, commitment, responsibility, education, excellence, and discipline are the core. Titles of the Sigma Pi Phi officers were also fashioned by Greek history. Grand Sire Archon, the chief executive officer and chairman. Grand Grammatius, manager of corporate records, protocols and rituals. And then Thes Curistus which administers the finances. The fraternity's logo included a griffin, a creature similar to the Finx. It was a legendary creature with the body, tail, and back legs of a lion, head and wings of an eagle with talons on its front legs, and it was known as the gatekeeper. The urn are the names of those chosen to lead the state. The theory of origin includes thoughts that these are dinosaurs. Greek and Latin sources had written descriptions of griffins as real creatures of Asia. In the third century, new details were said to have emerged about the griffin. Political researcher and lecturer of African-American communities, Steve Coakley, born June 17, 1952 and died April 11, 2012, was known for exposing the truth of black fraternities and sororities. He began to notice Boulay's logo and the one such meetings that were being held in LA in 1941 in Griffin Park. 
He also noticed that all the top of every profession were members of one of the secret organizations, specifically fraternities and sororities in the Divine Nine. Alphas boast they make up 90% of black lawyers. A fraternity Wikipedia claims is a Western concept developed in the Christian context, notably with the religious orders in the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Now, we've already talked about this. They are going to associate things that happen with the Catholic the Catholic Church in the Christian context, and we've already explained why that is. And so know that this is talking about the Catholic Church. It's telling us that the Catholic Church has within it fraternities um, that are modeled just like the ones from the Divine Nine, because the Divine Nine actually got their model from them, from the Catholic Church, or the the secret societies that make um, that are within the Catholic Church. The concept was extended into the modern era, such as free- Freemasonry. Exactly. And that's something that we will talk about. The Divine Nine, or the National Pan-Hellenic Council, is what is known as BGLOs, or Black Greek Letter Organizations. It formed as a collaborative effort in 1930 with a stated mission and purpose that reads, anonymity of thought and action as far as possible in the conduct of Greek letter, collegiate fraternities and sororities, and consider problems of mutual interest to its member organizations. Founding organizations are Alpha Kappa Alpha, Kappa Alpha Psi, Omega Psi Phi, Delta Sigma Theta, and Zeta Phi Beta. Adding Alpha Phi Alpha and Phi Beta Sigma in 1931, Sigma Gamma Rho in 1937, and Iota Phi Theta in 1996. Oaths are taken by its members, not only an oath of silence, not to reveal matters of the organization, but to uphold the values of the organization, pledging heart and soul to it, and give lifelong service. In order to bond the individual to the service, initiates must go through a hazing ritual. Although hazing was made illegal after a series of three deaths in the 1980s, it is well known that it still occurs. Initiates go underground, also known as pledging. It can be brought about by whipping, beatings, starvation, or being made to consume disgusting or harmful items, perverse acts, playing with feces or urine, being treated as a servant, humiliation, and even sexual acts. If the pledge endures their time of being online, they've quote-unquote crossed the burning sands. ...was permitted in that area of the world that is called in scripture the Garden of Eden, or between the Tigris and Euphrates River. And here's Adam. Let us make a man. We got to give him a place. Well, if he gonna rule, he got to rule from the heartland, from the core. So here he comes among us. He had to speak our language in order to come among us. He knows Arabic and he knows Hebrew. He knew the language. He knew the customs. He learned the ways and he came among us. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said within six months, he had turned the Holy Land upside down telling lies, causing the original man to fight and kill one another. So they began to say, well, good God Almighty, when did we start having all this trouble? It was after that stranger came in here. (laughs) So then they rounded up all the strangers that they could find and chained them and drove them across the hot Arabian desert into the hills and cave sides of Europe. And this became the basis of all of your fraternal orders, crossing the burning sands. Who crossed the burning sands? How did they cross the burning sands? Who sent them across the burning sand? For what reason did we send them across the burning sand? And now, brother and sister, you repeat the same ritual. You join the Masonics, you got to cross the burning sand. You join Omega Sci-Fi, you got to cross the burning sand. 
You join Kappa Alpha Psi, you got to cross the burning sand. You join the Elks, you got to cross some burning sand. Why you got to cross over sand? Because I'm going to make you go the same route that your fathers made me go. The sands refer to the grueling path initiates endured. It also denotes a change in the old person to a new, as the teachings of the organization begin to take hold. The pain and suffering from the hazing acts is a ritual that too originated in ancient Greek and Roman societies. It was seen as a rite of passage and a tactic used to forge a bond of unity within the group and the individual to the organization. The initiates who do not pledge are called paper insinuating there was simply a signing of paperwork with no sacrifice. So there begins a circle within a circle. The Eleusinian mysteries were initiations held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone based at the Panhellenic sanctuary of Eleusis in ancient Greece. The Panhellenic sanctuary was a holy shrine or place of worship. These were neutral locations for political meetings and Panhellenic games. It was considered the most famous secret religious rite of ancient Greece. Their basis was a Bronze Age agrarian cult. Agrarianism is the philosophy which promotes subsistence farming and farm ownership whereby farmers grow crops for their families and the local community. It also meant producers and distributors of the food control the policies associated with it. Farming was seen as the only occupation offering total independence and self-sufficiency. Urban life, capitalism, and technology were believed to foster weakness. Farmers felt a sense of identity in the world order. Lastly, they claimed to follow God's example of creating order out of chaos. These tenets were defined by American academic M. Thomas N.G. Okay, I just want to add that you see how once again their secularist philosophies keep creeping in even when they're talking about God. Um, here they are trying to tell us that God created order out of chaos. But again, that's not what he did. He created order out of nothing. There was nothing at the beginning. And then he created everything that was in it. And when he created it, it had wisdom and order already in it because that is God's nature. So don't let them fool you with, you know, cute little phrases like order out of chaos. There wasn't a whole bunch of matter that was scattered about. And then all of a sudden, after millions of years, it got put together. And now we have trees and birds and plants and fruit and water. That's not how it works. Okay. Moving on. The Telesterion was the site of the Ulusian Mysteries. The hall was a 55-yard roof that holds a 3,000-person spread. No one revealed what happened at these events. When asked, the response was always, some things were done, things were shown, and things were said. The origin suggests once Persephone was taken to the underworld, Demeter looked for her, but given a child by Queen Messenera to nurse. The child, however, is made to pass through the fire before becoming immortal. Demeter, being angry, directs everyone to build a temple to her to appease her name. The most secretive element of the mysteries is the ceremony showing the sacred relics of Demeter. The mysteries represent three phases, descent or loss, search and ascent. Priest and priestesses, Hierophants and the Epoptia, those who learn the secrets of the greatest of Demeter's mysteries, participated in these mysteries. There are two Eleusinian mysteries, lower and greater. The lesser took place in midwinter, February to March. In order to qualify for initiation, participants had to sacrifice a piglet to Demeter and Persephone. The initiate was then made to purify himself in the river of Ilosos. Upon completion of the lower mysteries, participants were worthy to view the greater mysteries. On the 14th day of Bodromion, the first act was bringing sacred objects from 
Eleusis to Eleusinion, a temple in Athens. The 15th or day of gathering, the priests began the sacrifice. On the 16th, initiates washed themselves in Phileron, a sea on the bay of the Saronic Gulf. On the 17th, participants began Epidoria, a festival for the god of medicine, Asclepios. This was a festival within a festival, with a procession beginning at Keramikos, an Athenian cemetery. Upon reaching Eleusis, there was an all-night vigil where Initius drank a special drink called Kikion, thought to have psychedelic properties. On the 19th, Initius entered into the great hall called Telesterion, where only Hierophants could enter. Initius, before entering, would recite, I have fasted. I have drunk the kakion, I have taken from the kiste, meaning box, and at her working, it have put it back in the caliphus. The elements of the telestheron, things done, or dromamina, was a dramatized version of the Demeter and Persephone myth. Decnumina, or things shown, is when sacred objects were displayed. And legomena, things said, were commentaries accompanying things shown. When the elements work together, it is called epirheta, otherwise known as the unrepeatables. Initiates must vow secrecy not to reveal the secrets of the organization by penalty of death. On the 2nd, initiates poured libations to the dead. On the 23rd, the mysteries ended and everyone returned home. Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican political activist, was trying to break Blacks away from white establishments, but was met with opposition from the Black gatekeepers. In a New York Times article titled, Is There a Black Upper Class? by Monte Williams, March 7, 1999, he details when it was announced that in July 1990, Boulay met in L.A., and it was announced that a great elite group of men was meeting. In 1927, the Great Mississippi Flood covered the entire delta, displacing thousands of residents who, after being stranded on a levee, were desperate for food and shelter. Those on the levee were forced to work at gunpoint in an event known as the Greenville Camp. Presidential hopeful Herbert Hoover, wishing to avoid scandal, was advised to get big Negroes into the Republican Party. Hoover looked to Sigma Phi Pi member Robert Rusa Moten previous advisor on behalf of President Woodrow Wilson to investigate discriminatory conditions with African Americans. After reporting that indeed the conditions were deplorable, he was told to keep quiet about the matter, and once Hoover was elected as president, Moton was promised that he and his people would be put in key positions to make changes. From this, the Colored Advisory Commission was formed and led by Moton. The bankrupt farms were also given to these Black administrators. Indeed, Moton became the second principal of Tuskegee Institute behind the death of George Washington Carver, who was also Sigma Pi Phi. While Robert Moton was head of the Institute, a clinical study began known as the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment, lasting from 1932 to 1972. During this study, conducted in Macon County, Alabama, African American men were unknowingly injected with syphilis and the effects of the disease on the body were secretly monitored. Many places are named after R.R. Moton, including Moton Field, the training base for the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. Per CIA documents, R.R. Moton was found to be a spy for the U.S. or for the CIA who would run and tell what Marcus Garvey would speak about in his meetings. Stokely also goes further to mention Vernon Jordan, a black lawyer and lifelong member of the Council on Foreign Relations and member of the Bilderberg Group. He was also advisor to Bill Clinton. Clinton's first Bilderberg group was by invitation of Vernon Jordan. According to the article in the New York Times, Jordan will be remembered as one of the most influential behind the scenes advisors in Washington and on Wall Street, who currently strolled the halls of power while mentoring generations of black leaders. 
In a book by Lawrence Otis Graham titled Our Kinds of People, he writes how the stepping stone of the Black elite is college fraternities and sororities and social clubs for adults tailored to the Black aristocracy. Like Stokely, he believed the Boule and the Divine Nine were lower levels of a bigger hierarchy. But who?